All right, good to see everybody again. Uh, this is Lecture 4, uh, Part 1. We are in Chapter 5 of our book, uh, and we are beginning the examination of the causes of the Revolutionary War, and then we'll go on to uh, fight that war, which means we're in Chapter 5, basically, uh, until we get to our test. Uh, so uh, when we stopped last time, uh, we had uh, reached a, a very important watershed in the relationship between the English colonies and their mother country, uh, and that was in the aftermath of the great British victory uh, in the uh, French and Indian War, as the American colonists called it, or the Seven Years' War, as the Europeans called it, a victory that saw uh, the French and the Spanish expelled from the eastern portion of the North American continent. France lost all of her territory uh, in North America except for uh, some islands in the Caribbean. Uh, the Spanish uh, lost Florida and the Gulf Coast, and there uh, they were reduced to everything uh, west of the Mississippi River as well as some islands in the Caribbean. Uh, and so this was the this was the victory that the English colonists. Uh, and Great Britain had been striving towards since 1689, and it was it was at hand. Uh, it would weaken the Indians, although certainly not entirely remove them as a threat. Uh, it opened the door to the interior of the continent, at least as far as the Mississippi River, uh, for settlement by English colonists. Uh, and uh, the the various English colonies had uh, had claimed land beyond the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, in many instances, those claims uh, overlapped one another and, and were contested. Uh, uh, but the colonists now believed that not only had nearly a hundred years of warfare paid off, uh, they were getting security of uh, a greater degree, at least uh, on their frontier, uh, and they were going to derive the economic benefit uh, of westward expansion. Uh, but uh, this is not what happened. Uh, the security along the frontier, of course, was enhanced, but the Indians remained a threat as the raid by Chief Pontiac on the New England colony's frontier uh, in 1764 uh, proved. Uh, and what's more, the enormous debt that England had run up uh, fighting and winning the French and Indian War. Remember that in 1763, uh, the same year that the Peace of Paris is signed, uh, Britain's spending 50% of its annual budget just servicing that debt, just paying the interest uh, on that debt. Uh, this uh, backbreaking debt uh, is going to be the origin uh, of the uh, difficulties between England and her American colonies because uh, the English need to retire that debt. They need to pay it down as quickly as possible uh, because of the expansion of the British Empire uh, resultant of their victory in the French and Indian War. The British are not really going to get anything like a peace dividend, so they can't lower expenditures uh, in order to pay down the debt. Uh, so they've got to raise more revenue. And since the people in England had basically been taxed their eyeballs uh, during the war, Britain had borrowed enormous sums of money and really preferred not to borrow more. That would make things worse instead of better. Uh, the only place that the British could find new revenues was in America. And you will recall uh, that there had been an agreement uh, when the British started the uh, French and Indian War, a war that, unlike the previous three, began in America, uh, not in Europe. And it began over American questions, not European questions specifically who's going to control uh, the Ohio River Valley. And unlike the previous wars, King William's, Queen Anne's, King George's, uh, the British had made America, uh, not Europe, their, uh, the primary theater of operations. So that, that had all, uh, you know, uh, given the French and Indian War a character completely different. And it also helped to produce a, a completely different outcome. Uh, and when the British uh, began that commitment uh, to the American theater, uh, they had made a deal with the colonies that the colonies would, uh, under the pressure of wartime, pay for the operations of their own militia, whereas the British would pick up the tab uh, for the, the regular forces, the regular army, marines, and, and the navy. Uh, and when the war was over and victory was won, the colonies would help Britain retire the debt. Uh, and, and that is the deal. There's no signed formal agreement or anything like that. This is sort of the understanding. Seems perfectly reasonable. After all, as the British saw this, they were fighting this war uh, for the benefit of the American colonists primarily, uh, although certainly it benefits England as well uh, to capture control of half of the continent on the uh, other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, no nonetheless, uh, 
uh, the British fully expect the Americans to keep their part of the bargain. But uh, the British are also going to seek to get profits wherever they can, and that leads them to issue the Proclamation of 1763, uh, designed to forbid colonial expansion beyond the Appalachian Mountains and thereby protect the fur trade. Remember, the fur trade uh, has three essential elements. You have to have the forest, you have to have the woodland creatures that live in the forest, and you have to have the Indians who go trap those creatures and turn them into uh, commodities, uh, pelts. Uh, and if the colonists are allowed to expand in the interior, they're going to kill and drive off the game, kill or drive off the Indians. They're going to cut down most of the forest in order to make farms and plantations and towns and villages. There will be no fur trade, and therefore there will be no profit from the fur trade. And since the British need money wherever they can find it, protecting the fur trade is critical, and so the Proclamation of 1763. But as we saw last time out, the Proclamation of 1763 sets into motion a whole chain of events. Uh, it angers the American colonists who believe, uh, fairly or not, uh, that they are being deprived of the fruits of their victory, that, uh, that Britain is in essence uh, sort of double-crossing them, uh, if it were. They point out that there wouldn't have been a French and Indian War if the English hadn't given Fortress Louisburg back to the French at the end of King George's War. Uh, and uh, how can the colonies uh, help retire England instead if they don't get the economic windfall of expansion into uh, the interior? And so uh, the colonies basically reneged uh, on their promise uh, to help England retire the debt. They said, why should we pay for a war from which we get no benefit? Uh, and, and not everyone in the colonies felt that way. Not everybody in the colonies agreed to it. But this was, this was the general stance. Uh, this, of course, angered the British. They didn't understand this. This looked like ingratitude uh, on the part of the colonists who were ignoring everything that England had done for them in this last war and, and the previous wars. And so the British determined that if the Americans would not pay voluntarily, they would pay involuntarily. And in 1764, they passed what comes to be known as the Sugar Act, which taxes the importation into the American colonies of certain items like sugar, coffee, tea, and wine. So when a ship carrying those things came into an American port, uh, the merchant who uh, was going to buy that cargo would have to pay the tax on it, uh, and he would pass the cost of that tax along uh, to the consumer in the form of higher prices. Uh, and, and the British thought that this was fair, and they thought it was uh, necessary. Remember the preamble uh, to the Sugar Act spells it all out. It is just and necessary that a revenue be raised in America for defraying the expenses of defending, protecting, and securing the same. Uh, so the British are sort of emphasizing we're doing this to pay for the French and Indian War, which we fought for you, or which you promised you would help pay for, but if you're not going to keep that promise, we're going to make you do it. Now, obviously, this pours salt into the colonial wound uh, that believes that they're being forced to pay for a war from which they uh, get no immediate uh, benefit, no direct benefit, uh, but it also elevates elevates the argument. It's, it very quickly, after the passage of the Stamp Act, ceases to be a debate about who gets what from the French and Indian War and who ought to pay what. It becomes a debate over rights and powers because the Sugar Act is a law passed by the British Parliament in which the Americans have no representation, uh, a place where a representation is impracticable uh, for the Americans for a whole host of reasons, not the least to switch the distance uh, between England and America that makes communication uh, so slow uh, and so uh, uh, problematic. Uh, so uh, the, the parliament that enacts this law has no American voice, and the Americans are not able to vote against it. They're not able to amend it. They're not able to object uh, to it uh, before it becomes law. And here is where the colonies uh, find their true grievance because they believe that they are as English as the people who live in England and that as Englishmen they have certain rights. And one of those rights is that you can only be taxed by a government in which you are represented. Remember the colonies pay taxes, uh, but they pay those taxes to their own colonial governments, which they elect. So if they think those taxes are too high, uh, they can change that government by electing new officials who will roll back those taxes. Uh, so uh, the beef is taxation without representation violates the rights uh, of the colonists as English subjects. The British retort to this uh, was, was twofold. Uh, there was uh, uh, one uh, avenue uh, that said, well, you know, uh, are, do you really have all the rights of someone in 
England. After all, you are colonists. You're not pure Englishmen uh, in that sense. Uh, but the, the main argument that the British had is that the Parliament was the supreme governing body of the British Empire. It had full authority to do whatever it wanted. It could make any law that it wanted. It could pass any tax that it wanted. Uh, you could go back 100 years to the Navigation Acts in the 1760s, uh, and the Parliament had enacted trade regulations on the American colonies, and the colonies had had no more of a voice in the 1760s uh, than they do uh, in the 1760s. Uh, I'm sorry, in the 1660s than they do uh, in, in the 1760s. And, and so uh, what, what's the big deal? Well, the Americans say, well, there's a fundamental difference between enacting trade regulations that you know touch on the entire empire uh, and imposing direct taxation on English subjects uh, without their consent. So the colonists say we have certain rights. As Englishmen, we have certain rights, and we cannot be taxed by a government in which we have no voice. And the British say you do not necessarily have those rights, and Parliament can make any law, any rule, any tax that it wants. So the British are saying we have a power, and the Americans are saying no, you don't have that power. And the colonists are saying we have a right, and the British are saying no, you don't have that right. And since the British have no written constitution, there's no way to arbitrate this dispute. Uh, the colonies dig in their hills, the British dig in theirs. It doesn't help that uh, over 150 years of colonial evolution, uh, America has developed a pure form of democracy uh, than the British, where uh, the, the franchise, although nothing like the franchise today, and remember only white property holding males uh, can vote, but the franchise uh, is pretty widespread in, in America. America. The governments actually are representative. They do have to be responsive to the will of the people. Not quite the same thing in England, where uh, the political process uh, is somewhat corrupted, uh, where it's heavily uh, uh, stilted, if you will, uh, toward the, the ruling elite. Uh, so, the, although both sides are speaking English, they're kind of talking past each other. The words like liberty and democracy and the vote don't necessarily mean the same thing on either side uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so the Sugar Act changes the argument, changes the nature of the argument from one about uh, cost and benefits, literally, uh, to one about rights and powers. It makes it a constitutional argument, and that means that you're going to have a really hard time uh, finding a way to resolve it uh, to uh, everybody's satisfaction. Uh, you either have a right or you don't. You either have a power or you don't. You can't sort of kind of have a right. A government can't sort of kind of uh, have a power. Uh, and so as long as the colonists uh, insist that they have those rights and the British insist that they have those powers, you are at an impasse. Uh, and of course, it doesn't help at all uh, that when the British passed the Sugar Act of 1764, they let it be known that the, that, that wouldn't begin to raise the revenue that was necessary. This was just going to be the first of many taxes. Uh, and the need for more taxes uh, grew more acute because one of the colonial responses to the Sugar Act was to refuse to buy the taxed goods. Uh, they, they, people wouldn't buy them. Uh, and that means the merchants, uh, you know, wouldn't ship them in. That means no taxes were paid on them. Uh, people didn't necessarily do without. Uh, there was, remember, always a robust smuggling trade uh, in, uh, in the American colonies, uh, and that meant higher prices, but people were willing to pay higher prices uh, to avoid what they considered to be unconstitutional uh, taxation. Uh, so no surprise in that environment that in the next year, uh, the British came back with another tax uh, to impose uh, on the American colonists without their consent, once again, uh, a tax that was supposed to raise 65,000 pounds a year uh, for the British Treasury. And this is known as the Stamp Act. And in some way, uh, you could argue that this is kind of clever of the British. If uh, the Americans say, hey, we're English, you need to treat us like Englishmen, uh, the British could say, well, in England we have a stamp tax, and now we're going to have a stamp tax in America too. Uh, and whereas people could find a way around uh, the Sugar Act by not buying sugar, coffee, tea, wine, or smuggling it in, they're going to have a very hard time finding their way around the Stamp Act, which taxes all print matter and legal documents. So newspapers, magazines, playing cards, uh, posters, uh, uh, flyers, and 
deeds of land, bills of sale, marriage certificates, death certificates, uh, divorce uh, decrees, these sorts of things, all of this now would, have, would, would be taxed. Uh, and in order to show that you had paid the tax, you would have to get affixed to that document uh, a, a bright red revenue stamp. Uh, if any of you have ever opened a, a bottle of liquor or a pack of cigarettes, or I suppose in your case, if you've seen it done, perhaps on TV, uh, then you've noticed that uh, there's uh, a little label that goes over the top uh, of some uh, alcoholic beverages, and that in that the top of that uh, uh, the cigarette pack, there's this little blue piece of paper, and that you have to tear through to get it. Those are revenue stamps. Those are proof that taxes have been paid uh, on that uh, bottle of spirits or on that pack uh, of cigarettes. So uh, you could have uh, things printed on special watermarked paper, which would be the same thing. Uh, but for all those legal documents uh, and things like that, you would have to go to a British official and purchase from him uh, the stamp to affix to the document. And without the stamp, the document would not be legal and it would, it would not be binding. Uh, and uh, th therefore, this was not something that you could evade. There's no way to smuggle a legal bill of sale. There's no way to smuggle in a, a birth certificate or a marriage license or, or something like that. You've got to deal uh, with the British. And unlike the Sugar Act, which was going to find its way to the colonist really in the form of higher taxes, uh, and therefore after a while you might forget that you're being taxed. I mean, after all, when you go buy gasoline, are you conscious of the fact that you're paying something like 35, 37 cents worth of taxes to both the state and the federal government when you buy a gallon of gas. Uh, no, you're not. It's like, hey, a gallon of gas is, uh, you know, a, a dollar and, and 80 cents, uh, and, and that's just what it costs. And when you're sitting there watching the, uh, those little digital numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger as you're filling up uh, your, your car or your truck, you're not thinking for every gallon of gas, oh, there goes, you know, a dollar and 25 cents to Chevron, and there goes 35 cents uh, to the government. That's not how we, we calculate that. It just gas costs so much and, and we sort of you know, forget that, that part of that cost is taxation. So the Sugar Act would have worked that way uh, if Americans were willing to buy uh, the taxed commodities, but the Stamp Act is very different. Uh, it doesn't come to you in the form of higher prices. It requires you to proactively submit to the power of Parliament to levy a tax on you that you think violates your rights. Uh, the Stamp Act uh, requires you to do something, something specific. Uh, and so in that way, it's more akin to our income taxes, right? Uh, you might forget that there's a sales tax. Uh, you might forget that you're paying taxes on gasoline, but every year, once a year, the government requires you to fill out forms and to submit documentation to either pay or prove that you have paid your federal income taxes. And there's a deadline and they make a lot of noise about it on the news and you can't, you can't escape it. And so the Stamp Act is more akin to, to that in the way that it impacts uh, people. You have to confront the government's ability uh, to tax you and, and you have to to uh, not only confront it, you have to submit to it. Now, the British uh, were divided on this. There were some members of Parliament who said this is a mistake. You need to stop uh, poking the Americans. But the majority in Parliament uh, was all behind this, uh, and so the law was passed. And, but nonetheless, uh, the British Parliament knew uh, that, uh, and the King knew, uh, that this was not going to be popular in America, uh, that there was going to be resistance to it. Uh, and the British thought about it, and uh, the king came up with a, a way, he thought a very clever way, uh, to uh, get to the Americans, or at least a significant proportion of the American population, to swallow this law, to swallow this tax. And he was going to do that by using what was called the patronage. The patronage. You were going to have to ship all these stamps to America. When they got to America, they were going to have to go to the offices of stamp collectors. These were going to be the people who would collect the taxes in exchange for the revenue uh, stamps that needed to be affixed to documents or the, or the special watermark paper that needed to be used to print things. And these people would be employed by the British government. They would get a salary by the British government. The king said, well, I've got to have these people. Doesn't it make sense to hire people in America uh, to do this? I'm going to hire Americans. And these Americans will support the tax 
because their job is predicated on the tax and their family will support the tax because their income is based on that tax being in place. And then the friends uh, and relatives of the stamp uh, collectors will support the tax because they want their friend uh, to have a job and, and to get a salary. And therefore, I'm going to create a class of people who have an economic interest in the Stamp Act working. Uh, and so uh, the king appointed a bunch of stamp distributors. Uh, he uh, sometimes did it. Uh, without people actually even asking uh, for the job. He just, you know, asked governors, hey, tell me some of your prominent citizens who'd be willing uh, to do this. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of this, uh, these stamp distributors become the public face of British taxation without representation, British violation of American rights as Americans saw them. Uh, it was going to take time, of course, to set up this bureaucracy, to get all these stamps across the Atlantic Ocean, and that gave Americans time uh, to organize a resistance. Now, uh, remember, not all of the colonies are monolithic. Not everybody agrees that the British are stepping over line, that they're violating rights. There's at least a third of the American population that's, that thinks that Britain is well within its prerogative uh, to do these things, but there's another third that is vehemently opposed, and they begin to organize uh, committees of correspondence and committees of public safety, think spies, uh, who are going to, uh, to, to gather information and report things, that, and these, uh, these groups are going to com communicate with each other uh, from, from colony to uh, colony. Ultimately, uh, they're going to be known as the Sons of Liberty, a name that's actually coined uh, for them uh, by a member of the British Parliament uh, and the Sons of Liberty uh, are are very effective propagandists and they, they begin to push back uh, against uh, the Stamp Act as something that is unconstitutional and is unfair uh, and it's unjust and and they do a very good job of getting the American population uh, worked up about uh, the Stamp Act and there are politicians in the colonial assemblies across the 13 colonies who are uh, sympathetic uh, to the Sons of Liberty, if not members of the Sons of Liberty, uh, and they are looking for an opportunity uh, to push back uh, in a legal perspective. And here, uh, the man who kind of comes to the forefront first is a young uh, Virginia lawyer uh, and legislator named Patrick Henry. And what Patrick Henry did is he introduced into the Virginia Colonial Assembly, which was still known as the House of Burgesses, this, this uh, self-governing body that had actually been created uh, by the Virginia Company way back in the Jamestown era as sort of an inducement to convince people to risk their lives and cross the Atlantic Ocean and come uh, to that initially very dangerous and unhappy colony. Uh, Patrick Henry uh, proposes seven resolutions, and they collectively come to be called the Virginia resolutions. Again, what we uh, call things in early American history is, is not subtle. Uh, and the Virginia resolutions all made a stand against the Stamp Act, that it was unfair, that it was unjust, that it was unconstitutional. Uh, but each of them said it in increasingly strident tones. So the first of them, very polite, dignified language. Uh, but by the end, uh, Patrick Henry uh, is using words like this. The Stamp Act is, quote, illegal, unconstitutional, unjust, and has a manifest tendency to destroy British as well as American liberty, uh, unquote. And when he read that out loud in the Virginia Colonial Assembly, uh, some of the more conservative members were shocked you know, to see such language thrown at the mother country. And, and supposedly some of them stood up and said, treason, treason, this is treason. And Patrick Henry is said to have paused and looked around the room with great effect and then said, if this be treason, let us make the most of it, unquote. And he pushed the Virginia resolutions through uh, for a vote. Uh, and fortunately for Henry, uh, a, a considerable number of the more conservative members of the assembly uh, had taken leave. Uh, the, the session was almost over. Some of them had gone home early. Uh, that left the radicals, if you will, uh, with the majority, and they managed to pass five of the seven resolutions through uh, for a vote. Even the radicals weren't willing to vote up uh, the two most uh, stringent uh, of the resolutions. But nonetheless, uh, by getting the Virginia resolutions through uh, the Colonial Assembly uh, in, uh, in Virginia, Patrick Henry has accomplished something rather monumental. For the first time, a colonial government has put its foot down, looked England in the eye, and said, no, no, 
we're not going to let you tax us. We're not going to surrender our rights like this. And it wasn't just any colonial assembly that had done this. It was Virginia, uh, the leading southern colonies, one of the most important colonies. The first colony uh, had done it. Uh, and Virginia leads, others follow. And so Massachusetts, the, in essence, the second colony, if you will, and the most important of the New England colonies, and a colony that's always had a radical bent. Remember that the people who settled Massachusetts are separatist and Puritans, people who hadn't been able to get along with the British church and the British government uh, back uh, in the early 1600s and had come to America. As a result, Massachusetts is, is clearly the most radical of all the colonies uh, in, in the New World. And in response to the, um, the Virginia resolutions, the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly called for a general meeting of all the colonies to come together uh, in October of 1765 uh, for what they called a Stamp Act Congress. Uh, and nine colonies actually sent delegates. And so think of this, you know, it, heretofore we've had the colonies come together in a Congress to deal with a specific problem, and that was the Albany Congress on the eve of the French and Indian War. So a common problem uh, results in the colonies coming together to try and figure out a common solution to make a common cause. And so that had been war with the French, the Spanish, and the Indians. Uh, now it was the relationship with the mother country. And these nine colonies send their delegates to the Stamp Act Congress in October 1765, and they make a common statement. What comes out of the Stamp Act Congress is a petition to England uh, signed by nine colonial governments that basically says in very diplomatic language, the Stamp Act is wrong. Uh, and that, quote, no taxes should be imposed on the American colonies but with their own consent, unquote. So now eight other colonies have lined up behind Virginia. So it's not just one colony, it's nine colonies who've told England no. And that sends a signal uh, to the ordinary citizen, right? Your own government is saying that what the British are trying to do is wrong, it's unconstitutional, it's unjust. And that basically gives a green light uh, to people who wish to resist who wish to ignore that law, who wish to evade that law, or who wish to take matters into their own hands. Uh, and so uh, now the mobs know uh, that they can take to uh, the streets. And angry people uh, took to the streets uh, and they went after the, the personification of the Stamp Act, which remember is those poor stamp distributors. So in every town and city across America, stamp distributors were hunted down. They were tarred, feathered, uh, they were threatened, they were humiliated, they were beaten up, they were run out of town on a rail, uh, and nowhere was it worse uh, than in Boston, where the stamp distributors, a man named Andrew Oliver, who is also a lawyer, uh, he was tracked down, uh, not by one mob, uh, but by three mobs, and on three separate occasions, forced to publicly renounce his position as a stamp distributor. Another mob couldn't find him, but it knew where his law office was, and it went and it destroyed the building, took it apart brick by brick, and then they heard a rumor that Oliver was hiding out in the home of uh, Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson, and they stormed toward the governor's house and threatened to take it apart as well until Hutchinson managed to convince them he, he's not here. And the upshot of this is that uh, on the day that the Stamp Act was supposed to take effect, there was not a single stamp distributor on the job anywhere in North America. Uh, and that meant that, uh, technically speaking, anybody uh, who uh, printed anything, anybody who got married, anybody who had a child, anybody who sold something and, and needed a bill of sale or, or got a deed of land, in fact, anybody who died, because you can't really legally die until you have a death certificate. Anybody who does any of these things is now a criminal because you are not purchasing the revenue stamps to affix to the legal documents. You're not printing your newspaper on uh, the, the approved uh, paper. Uh, and so uh, what do people do? Uh, do, the, do they not do these things? Do they stop getting married, having children, dying, uh, printing, reading, uh, buying, selling, uh, because that means they're breaking the law? Or do they break the law and they continue living? Well, of course what they do is they break the law. 
uh, and they can uh, continue living. And that means suddenly almost all of America uh, is a class of felons. Uh, and worse for the British, American resistance began to harden. Uh, and the colonists began to talk about taking economic sanctions, as we would term it today, against England and refusing to buy British goods. Uh, and there were even some movements uh, to this effect, uh, not uh, wholly effectual, not universal by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but uh, this began to hurt British merchants and it scared them even worse. It terrified them because uh, America was a major market. As the Americans stopped buying British goods, it would be devastating uh, for business. Uh, and, and so the British merchant class began to put pressure on Parliament. What you're doing isn't working. Uh, you can't make it work. It's making things worse. And disaster looms if you do not back down. And although not all of the Parliament uh, was willing uh, to back down, uh, a great deal of the Parliament was. Uh, and on February 22nd of 1766, George Washington's birthday, uh, by the way, February 22nd of 1766, by a vote of 275 to 167, the British Parliament repealed the Stamp Act. They repealed the Stamp Act. So although technically it had gone into uh, force, it had never really operated. Uh, the Americans managed to shut it down uh, before it could have any substantial effect. And the Americans sort of dusted off their hands. They said, well, I think we, we've proved our point. Uh, the British won't be trying that again. And in fact, the colonies have learned a lesson here, haven't they? If Britain does something you don't like, pitch a fit, throw a fuss threaten economic sanctions, uh, practice civil disobedience, attack British officials, and what will Britain do? Britain will back down. This is akin uh, to the little kid uh, in the grocery store waiting in line to, to check out, uh, you know, who wants some candy and mom won't buy the candy. And so the kid starts to yell and scream and cry and kick up a fuss. And it's annoying to everybody who's around uh, and it's embarrassing for the mom. Uh, and uh, so the mom uh, gives in it, buys the kid the candy uh, just to get the kid to shut up. And that works. The kid gets what it wants. The, ki the kid uh, stops making a scene. But what have you just taught that child? child. You taught that child that this is the kind of behavior that gets rewarded. So the next time you want something and mom or dad says, no, this is the way you act and you're, you'll get what you, you want. And, and this is the lesson that the repeal of the Stamp Act has inadvertently taught the American colonies. If the Americans, however, believe that they have made their point, uh, they are badly mistaken because just a few weeks after the Stamp Act was repealed, the British Parliament uh, enacted another law, not technically a law, uh, but um, it, it, it more of a resolution it called the Declaratory Act uh, in March of 1766. And, and what the Declaratory Act did was to simply state that Parliament had the right to levy taxes on the American colonies, that Parliament was in fact, quote, supreme over the Americans in all cases whatsoever. Parliament is supreme over the Americas in all cases whatsoever, unquote. So if the Americans thought they had made their point with the British, they are badly mistaken. They haven't made their point at all. All Britain has done is backed away from an unworkable law. And what's more, of course, is with the Sugar Act underperforming uh, and the Stamp Act basically obliterated, Britain's not raising much in revenue. That debt is still there. That enormous weight on the British budget and the British economy is still there and Britain's imperative need to get that debt paid down uh, is still there. So there's no question uh, that the British are going to come back with taxes. Uh, this is going to surprise some of the Americans, but it really shouldn't. There's only one place where the British can substantially raise additional revenue, and it's in the colonies. The British are going to wait a while. They're going to let things cool off uh, before they, they return with new taxes. But uh, in January of 1767, the Parliament imposes a fistful of new taxes uh, under the collective name of the Townsend Revenue Acts, the Townsend Revenue Acts. Uh, these laws were more akin to the Sugar Act, so they taxed the importation into the colonies of certain commodities. Uh, and amongst this, you know, there were some higher taxes on things like tea, but now you're also taxing paper and glass and paint. And 
Whereas you might be able to get around tea or wine or something like that. Now, glass and paint and, and, and paper are much harder commodities to actually live without. They're, they're harder to smuggle in. Uh, and uh, now you're going to have to pay taxes on those or the merchants who import them are going to have to pay taxes and pass the cost along to the consumer in form of higher prices. And remember, there were a whole bunch of British laws that made it illegal for the Americans uh, to, uh, to produce certain kind of goods and paper and glass uh, and paint uh, were among them. So you had to buy them from England, which meant that if you brought them in legally, you were going to have to pay the British taxes, either directly or, or indirectly. Uh, and uh, since the British knew that there was going to be resistance to these new taxes uh, and that they were going to have to uh, work very hard to enforce them, uh, they created a new bureaucracy, a new organization. Uh, to enforce these taxes, the, the Sugar Act as well, and in addition, the Navigation Acts uh, of the 1660s. And this new organization was called the American Board of Customs Commissioners. The American Board of Customs Commissioners. There were Americans on it, but there were also men sent from England. And the customs commissioners were basically charged with cracking the whip making the Americans understand that they were going to have to obey all of Britain's laws, uh, whether they liked it or not. Uh, that, of course, set them up to be very powerful. It also set them up to be very unpopular. Uh, and that creates an environment that is ripe for corruption. Uh, because basically, if I get to uh, enforce rules, and those are rules you don't like, uh, and I have kind of carte blanche to make the enforcement of those rules as draconian as I think necessary, uh, then you know I, I have a situation to where uh, if you were willing uh, to make an accommodation with me, uh, I might uh, make things easier for you. I can insist that every I and every T uh, be exactly as they should be, uh, unless, unless, if I turned around uh, and, uh, and, uh, and looked uh, behind me for a moment and then I, I spun back around to face you and, and there's a hundred dollar bill uh, on, on the table. Well, where, where did that come from? Well, nobody knows. Well, that makes me in a better mood. I'm not so interested in having those I's dotted and those T's crossed. Why don't you go on uh, about your business? So corruption uh, was, was also going to be a problem. And the Americans, of course, are not going to like this. They, they, they think the Townsend Revenue Acts are as un, unfair and as unconstitutional as the Sugar Act or the Stamp Act. Uh, but for the custom commissioners, what was all important was it didn't matter what the Americans thought. The Americans were going to have to toe the line. They were going to have to obey the law. Uh, and they wanted to send a message. They wanted to make that very clear. So they needed to basically find somebody prominent uh, that they could crack the whip over uh, and send the signal that this is the way things are going to be now. If you don't like it, well, maybe corruption would, would, would let you have a way to escape it. Uh, but but this, is, this is the way things are going to be done going forward. And in Boston, the man that they picked upon was a wealthy merchant by the name of John Hancock, who really wasn't a political person at all. He had a large fleet of ships. He was engaged somewhat in the smuggling, but he did uh, most of his business uh, legally. Uh, but he was very, very well known. And so anything you did to John Hancock uh, would, would be noticed and the word was spread. And that's exactly the kind of fellow uh, that you wanted. And so the customs commissioners are going to get John Hancock, not on failure to pay taxes, but for failure to abide by the letter of the law when it came to the old Navigation Acts of the 1660s. So remember the Navigation Act of 1660, you know, draws up a list of valuable goods. And it says any of these goods that are leaving an American port must be carried in a British ship with a crew that's at least 75% uh, British or American. And that, that ship must go either to England or to another British colonial port. And that, that was the law. It's been in effect for more uh, than 100 years. But over the course of 100 years, the way that the law was enforced had changed. Um, there's the letter of the law. And then there is the practice of the law, the way that laws are actually enforced. An example, 
we have speed limits, right? So if you're going down a road and the speed limit is 55, if you're going 56, you're breaking the law, right? And you can be pulled over and you can be ticketed. And the fine for going one mile over the speed limit in most jurisdictions is the same as going 10 miles over the speed limit. So you, if you're doing 56, you might as well be doing 58. You're, you're gonna pay the same fine. Uh, but most of us are aware, I think, that uh, you're very unlikely to get pulled over for doing 56 and a 55. You're unlikely to get pulled over for doing 57 and a 55. And even 58 might not do it. In fact, in a lot of places, there's a general assumption that there's a, a four or five mile per hour cushion because speedometers are inexact, traffic conditions are what they are. Uh, the number of law enforcement officers out there is limited, it, it's finite, uh, and uh, they have uh, worse uh, the criminals to deal with than somebody who's going three miles over the speed limit unless you're going through a school zone or a construction zone or, or something like that. So if you're doing 57 and a 55 and you roll past an officer, so long as you're not firing your gun out uh, of your window or, or drugs aren't falling out of the trunk of your car or something like that, uh, you're, you're probably not going to be bothered. You're not going to be pulled over. You're not going to be ticketed. But if the officer wanted to do that, it would be within his or her legal right to do it. You would be breaking the law. 55 is 55. It's not 55-ish. 55 is 55. And you're going 57, you're breaking the law. We know that very unlikely that you'll get a ticket under ordinary circumstances for doing that, but you could. And so the same kind of logic now applies to the Navigation Act of 1660. Valuable goods must go to England or another British colony. Well, how do you know what goes into the hold of a ship? You could put valuable goods in the bottom third of your cargo hold, and then you could put non-valuable goods in the upper two-thirds. Uh, and, uh, and then when you go to leave port, you could say, oh, no, I don't have any of those valuable goods here. Let me open the hatch, look down, see, no, there's a, a whole shipload full of teddy bears. I don't have any tobacco or wood or tar or turpentine or cotton or indigo. I, I have any of that. So... How do you avoid somebody playing that trick? Well, what the Navigation Act of 1660 says is that you must turn in your cargo manifest to the authorities before you load your ship. And if the authorities want, they can come down and watch you load the ship. They can make sure that the entire cargo hold is full of teddy bears and we're not putting some tobacco and cotton down uh, at the bottom and the teddy bears all on top. So the British authorities have the right to do that. But consider how impracticable that is. It's for the same reason uh, that you're not going to be, you know, chasing down people doing 57 and a 55. There are only a certain number of traffic officers, and, and they have uh, many worse things that they're looking out for than somebody going two miles over the speed limit. So there are only so many British officials. There are hundreds and hundreds of ships leaving America's 3,000 mile long coastline every single day. You don't begin to have enough British officials to watch every ship be loaded. And if you insisted on that, commerce would basically come to a stop. So only in very rare instances was it done that way. And thus, the custom by which the law was enforced uh, came to be that you loaded your ship. Before you set sail, you turned in the cargo manifest. The officials looked at that manifest. Usually, they just rubber stamped it. If they were suspicious, they could come and inspect your ship and make you unload part of it and that kind of thing. Very seldom happened, but, the, but they could do it. But this is the way that business was done. And it's the way that it had been done for almost 100 years. In the same way, you know 57 and 55 is unlikely to get you a ticket. But now there's a new organization. There's a new sheriff in town, if you will, the American Board of Customs Commissioners, and they want to send a signal. They want to send a signal that now the law is going to be rigorously enforced. We're going to rigorously enforce the Navigation Acts as we're, as we're going to rigorously enforce the Sugar Act, as we're going to rigorously enforce the Townsend Revenue Act. No more laxity. We're going to crack down on the Americans. We're going to make them understand who's in charge. And so one of Hancock's ship captains has loaded his vessel, as he's done a hundred times. He takes his cargo manifest to the new authorities, the customs commissioners now, but he's turned in cargo manifest hundreds of times to English officials. And when he turns it in, the customs commissioners uh, look at the cargo manifest, and they look at him and they say, is the ship already loaded? 
question he's heard a hundred times. He answers it as he's answered a hundred times. Oh, yeah, the ship's already loaded. But the response now isn't, okay, very good, yeah, go on about your business. No, now he gets something completely different. You're under arrest. You're under arrest. And your ship and its cargo are confiscated. Uh, impounded by uh, the British government and the ship captain, well, what, what? This has never happened before. And they inform him that he's just been clocked going 57 in a 55. He's broken the letter of the law. And there's no debating that. So ship, cargo, confiscated, sold at auction, signal sent. Signal sent, American colonists. This is the way things are going to be from this point forward. The response of the customs or to the customs commissioners was not what they expected, however, uh, because Americans would not stand for this. Uh, they, and so there was a riot. There was a riot in Boston. Angry people stormed the headquarters of the American Board of Customs Commissioners. They chased them out of town. They had to flee to the decks of a British warship in, in Boston Harbor. And once more, the Americans sort of dusted off their hands and said, well, I think we've taken care of that. But once more, uh, if the Americans believed that, they were mistaken because the customs commissioners didn't care much for the way they'd been treated. And they sent a letter uh, to England uh, that the Americans are in defiance of his majesty's laws and the parliament's laws. And if the king wishes those laws to be enforced, he had better send troops. And the king agreed and he ordered troops to Boston. It would take time for them to get there, of course. And in the interim, the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly sent out a letter to the other colonies and said, hey, we got together to undermine the Stamp Act. Let's get together to undermine uh, the Townsend Revenue Acts and the American Board of Customs Commissioners. A copy of this letter got across the Atlantic Ocean and landed on the desk of one Lord Hillsborough, His Majesty's Colonial Secretary, the sort of guy who was in charge of what goes on for the British government in the New World. And he read the letter. And he saw it for what it was, treason against the crown. These are the, uh, the uh, subsidiary governments of the British Empire uh, colluding, conspiring uh, to subvert British parliamentary law. And Lord Hillsborough understood how to deal with treason. And so he sends a letter to Massachusetts demanding uh, that it rescind its call for a colonial congress and letter to the other colonial governments telling them, don't you dare do it. Well, there was no meeting, uh, but uh, the government of Massachusetts, its colonial assembly, defied the British, defied the British by a vote of 92 to 17. It refused to rescind the letter. At which point, Lord Hillsborough ordered the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly dissolved. He threw it out of office and uh, told the people of Massachusetts to elect a new assembly, which the people of Massachusetts did, sending exactly the same people uh, back to the post from which they had just been uh, evicted. Uh, and so this was sort of a signal that things are getting worse now, not better. Uh, the Americans are still not in a mood to back down, and the British are not in a mood uh, to be defied. And in that environment, in October of 1768, 4,000 British troops transferred from Nova Scotia and Ireland arrived in Boston. And they marched into the city. They established their camps in the center of town uh, on Boston Common, uh, and the American customs commissioners came off the ship, went back to work, and if you think that they had been hard to deal with before, well, it was even worse now because they had a score to settle uh, with the people uh, of, of Boston. Uh, and so uh, the things are not good now, especially in, in Massachusetts. There's tension everywhere, uh, but it's particularly bad in Massachusetts. Uh, the uh, people of Boston and Massachusetts did not look at the rival of the British redcoats or, or British regulars, as they would have called them, uh, uh, with kindly eyes. Uh, there was no concept uh, that the, the men of the British Army represented the best and brightest uh, of the, the English Empire. No, most people believe that you didn't go into the army unless uh, you were a ne'er-do-well or, or uh, a drunkard or you were somebody seeking out adventure or, 
or you know you you could find no other way to put clothes on your back and, and food in your belly uh, the americans had kind of sour attitudes toward a lot of the british as a result of their various mishaps in the four wars uh the leading up to uh, the peace of paris uh and, and, and but they basically understood that these redcoats are here to be the muscle the muscle behind the customs commissioners who were hated and despised along with the taxes and the rules uh, that they were enforcing. Uh, so uh, here you've got these, these, uh, these soldiers who are the bayonets that are going to shove these unjust, unconstitutional laws down the throats of the American uh, people. It doesn't help that pay in the British Army was very low, uh, and so uh, a lot of British soldiers in their off-duty hours moonlighted. They, they took lots of odd jobs. They would work for much lower wages than American colonists, and so uh, the employers are hiring them instead of uh, Native uh, Americans, uh, and, and that uh, is an economic blow, and it makes things worse. And so the tension builds and builds and builds. It gets so bad that if you were a colonist or if you're a redcoat, the one thing you dare not do in Boston at night is wander the streets by yourself. There were gangs of British soldiers, gangs of American uh, colonist patriots, as they would call themselves, uh, who would linger and, and lurk and, and look for a, a lone, unsuspecting fellow from the other side, and they would pounce on him and, and beat him up and these kinds of things. Uh, and, and so the pot is beginning to boil. The pot is beginning to boil. This is not a good mix. Uh, and it finally boils over on March 5th of 1770 in the form of something called the Boston Massacre. And the Boston Massacre is a spontaneous event. It takes place outside the headquarters of the American Board of Customs Commissioners. Fascinating thing unto itself, uh, but we need only deal with the, the broad brushstrokes of it here. Uh, some boys started to throw snowballs at a British sentry. Uh, the British sentry warned them off. Uh, and uh, that attracted a crowd of adults who began to yell at, at the British and shake their fist. And, and the sentry uh, called for the sergeant of the guard uh, who brought the picket reserve uh, to uh, secure their, uh, their threatened comrades. So you wind up with five redcoats standing with almost literally their backs against the wall on an icy sidewalk, their officer there with them. Uh, it's it's uh, dark. A uh, very angry and growing crowd of uh, colonists shouting, yelling, pressing closer and closer uh, to the redcoats, snowballs flying through the air, uh, some of the Americans carrying umbrellas and other things that looked like uh, dangerous weapons. Uh, in, in the evening, uh, the British warned the Americans back. The Americans refused to back up. The British present their bayonets toward the Americans in an intimidating uh, and also provocative gesture. Uh, and uh, people on both sides nervous, frightened, angry, and then <clears throat> one of the British soldiers slips on the icy sidewalk, and as he falls, he accidentally discharges his musket. So there's a gunshot, and out of the corner of their eye, the British soldiers see one of their own go down. They hear a gunshot at almost the same instant. They make the very human assumption that someone in this mob in front of them has fired upon them, and one of their comrades has been hit. And then with or without orders, it, how exactly it happened is debated, the British redcoats leveled their muskets and they opened fire. They opened fire and five colonists died. And five colonists died and the crowd immediately dispersed. And now it's happened. For the first time in this dispute, English soldiers have killed English colonists. And this brings America and Great Britain to the precipice of war. If this is not handled correctly and quickly and equitably, it could escalate in the blink of an eye to war. And not just war, but civil war, the worst kind of war imaginable. We think of the American Revolution today as a war between two nation states, the United States and, and England. But it wasn't that when it started. It was a war between two parts of the British Empire, a war brother against brother, father against son, cousin against cousin. Uh, and those wars are always viciously fought and especially tragic. And the British didn't want that war. And the American colonists didn't want it. And so both sides backpedaled away from the possibility as quick as they could go. The British withdrew their troops 
put them on an island in Boston Harbor. The customs commissioners were told to mind their manners and stop provoking the colonists. The British allowed the soldiers and their officer to be arrested and tried before a colonial judge and jury, but no less a person than John Adams, one of the more prominent members of the Sons of Liberty, who was the brother of the leader of that organization in Boston, uh, a real radical patriot by the name of Sam Adams. John Adams, who was a purist in pursuit of justice, uh, defended uh, the Redcoats and basically got them off. He got them off. Uh, but the biggest concession came uh, from the British, who in response to this so-called Boston Massacre, repealed all but one of their taxes. The, the Americans had a big advantage here. This event, of course, happened in the colonies, and it took almost two months for news of it to get to England. So by the time the British could respond, the, the Sons of Liberty had already spread their version of events that said that this had been cold-blooded murder, deliberate cold-blooded murder on the part uh, of the British. Uh, and and uh, newspapers editorialized and, and preachers uh, lamented the, the widows and the orphans left behind by the five Americans who had been so cruelly shot down uh, by the Redcoats. And the irony here is that none of the five were married. Uh, none of them had any children, as far as we know. They left behind no widows. In fact, one uh, was a free black uh, who was in, in, in the crowd. Uh, and, but you understand why the Americans were angry and why the British felt that they must retreat or risk civil war. And in fact, the British retreat almost completely. They repeal all of their taxes except one. They leave in place one very small tax on tea. But with the customs commissioners on a short leash, the troops gone, and the taxes repealed, the Americans could, with much more legitimacy this time, argue, we've made our point. We've solved the problem. And to an extent, they had, although the British still believed that they retained the power to tax the Americans if they so desired. Uh, they had come to understand that they didn't have the capacity to do it. It was their legal right. They couldn't make it work. It was too hard. It was counterproductive. It was counterproductive. And for a time, everything seemed to calm down. Everything seemed to calm down. But not for long. There's too much water under the bridge now. There's too much unhappiness. There's too much distrust. And the Sons of Liberty are not willing to relent. They believe that what Britain is doing is not honest. It's a, it's a tactical retreat. They haven't conceded anything. And they found vindication for their suspicion in the one tax the British had left in place, and that was a tax on tea. It was a small tax, penny a pound basically, would only modestly affect the price of the tea. But the British had left that one in place. And the Sons of Liberty wanted to know why. And they asked that question. Why? Why did you repeal all of the rest but this one? This one tiny tax on tea, which surely is not raising that much revenue for you. And the British didn't answer. Did they leave it behind by mistake? Was it bureaucratic oversight? Perhaps. Well, if it was, now that we've told you it's there, why haven't you repealed it? No answer. And nature abhors a vacuum, and politics abhors a vacuum even more. And if the British would not explain why they left that tax on tea in place, then the Sons of Liberty would offer an explanation of their own, and that explanation was basically they did it on purpose. They did it on purpose. It's a trick. It's a trick. It's a trick because what the British intend to do is to fool us into paying taxes. So this tax on tea is small. It's small deliberately because it doesn't really affect the price. And we'll just get used to tea being a little bit more expensive. And we'll buy British tea. And our merchants will import British tea. And when they import the tea, they'll pay the tax on that tea. And then we'll subsidize paying that tax by paying the higher prices. And the British will let that go on for one or two or three or five or ten years. And... By so doing, they will be establishing a legal precedent. 
the legal precedent of taxation without representation. And then at some point in the future, count on it, the British will turn around and there'll be a new Stamp Act or a new Sugar Act or a new Townsend Revenue Act, a tax that will really bite, that will feel, that will be obvious, and will say, whoa, wait a second. We thought we won this argument. We, we thought this debate was over. We are English colonists. We have rights. We cannot be taxed uh, without our consent. Uh, and the British will say, well, that's interesting because you've been paying a tax that you haven't consented to for the last five, ten years. And you didn't object. And we'll suppose that the reason you didn't object is it's not the principle of the thing, it's that the tax didn't hurt, that you didn't fill it in your pocketbook. And now that we come back with taxes that you feel that, that take a bite out of your wallets, now suddenly you once again have rights. You, oh, your old precious rights actually aren't the things that you care about, it's your money that you care about. And the Sons of Liberty argue if we let the British do this to us, if we let the British do this to us, then basically we have sold our rights and liberties down the river forever. Now, at first, not everybody agreed with what the sons of Louis. Some people are like, wow, guys, this is, this is a little out there. But as time went on and the British didn't explain why they left that tax on tea in place, it became more and more plausible to believe that they left it in place on purpose. It's an entering wedge as a trick. Maybe it was to save face, but maybe, more probably, it's a trick. We don't really know, in all likelihood, what the British were doing was trying to save face, but there were some people in Parliament who might have seen this thing as the camel's nose under the tent, if you will, that this was a ploy to set the precedent of parliamentary taxation without representation and make it impossible for the colonists to morally or legally argue against it uh, in the future. But whatever the case, ultimately, the American people, at least a substantial segment of them, came to believe what the Sons of Liberty were saying. And the tensions began to ratchet up. Navigation acts, of course, are still in place. Smuggling is still going on. British revenue cutters are off the American coast trying to, to shut it down. Uh, in August, of 1772, a British uh, warship, the HMS Gatsby, uh, caught sight of a smuggler off the coast of Rhode Island, gave chase. The smuggler ran uh, for the shallow waters along the coast, waters that its captain knew like the back of his hand. The much deeper draft British vessel uh, enjoyed no such uh, knowledge, and as it chased the Americans in the shallows, it ran fast to ground. Couldn't get itself floated free. And after hours of trying, you can imagine that the, the British sailors were gratified to see boatloads of people coming from the shore. Uh, they expected these were the colonists coming to throw them some ropes and help tow them off, but no, instead the Americans boarded the ship, forced its crew overboard, and then burned the vessel, destroyed one of His Majesty's warships before returning to the interior of Rhode Island. Well, this is a crime. It's an act of terror, as we might term it today. Uh, uh, it was considered an outrage by the British. They sent investigators to Rhode Island to apprehend the people who had done this heinous thing. But when they got there, lo and behold, nobody in the whole colony knew anything about it. A British warship burned off our coast, you say? For God's sake, when did that happen? I didn't hear anything about it. Oh, I was in Connecticut that day. I, I couldn't tell you uh, anything about it, I, let alone begin to suggest who might have been responsible. The, the British never caught the culprits. And they learned that lesson that trying to seek out the individuals was probably impossible if they could hide uh, in a sympathetic population. And this is something the colonies are going to remember. So the, the tensions are building. The, the pot is beginning to boil again. Would it inevitably lead to an explosion? Maybe, maybe not. But the British took an act in 1773, took a step that's going to ensure that we do get that explosion. And ironically, that step has nothing whatsoever to do with taxes or the debt from the French and Indian War or anything like that. It is an effort by the British to bail out the East India Company, the East India Company. The East India Company is a monopoly that the British have given the rights 
to in India. The, so remember, the British like this business of indirect rule rather than the government, you know, bear the burden of, of colonizing and, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, hey, we'll give this company the right to do it and the, the empire will expand, the British, you know, economy will expand, but the British government won't bear the cost of it. So the East India Company had a monopoly to grow tea in India. And the problem for the East India Company is that it, its commodity, its tea, was being undercut in the marketplace uh, by tea grown by the Dutch and smuggled to places like North America. Uh, and, uh, and that meant that the East India Company was not making profit, wasn't making profit. In the spring of 1773, it had 18 million pounds of unsold tea in its warehouses. Its stock price tumbled by nearly 100 pounds. The company was very much looking like it was going to go bankrupt, and that would be a devastating blow for the British economy. It would be a devastating blow for the East India Company's uh, shareholders. It would be a devastating blow to England's ambition to control the subcontinent of India. And so to save the East India Company from bankruptcy, the Parliament passed something called the Tea Act in May of 1773, the Tea Act. The Tea Act is not. The Tea Act is not. The Tea Act is not a tax. Not a tax. It's a bailout. What the Tea Act basically does is to free the East India Company from the strictures of the Staple Act, passed way back in 16. 63. And you remember what the Staple Act says, all goods going to America must pass through England first. So when an East India Company ship left India and went around Africa, rather than go straight across the Atlantic to America, it had to go up to England and then over. Well now, no longer. You can send your tea straight to America. That shaves weeks, sometimes months off the voyage, and literally time is money. It takes you a lot less time to get the tea to America. That means it costs you a lot less to get it there. And so now when that British tea comes into American ports, that East India Company tea comes into American ports, even after the, the modest tax is charged on it, merchants will be able to sell it cheaper than the smuggled tea that's coming in from the Dutch. And for the British Parliament, this is a win-win for everybody, right? It's a win for the East India Company, it's a win for England, and it's a win for the colonists who can now legally buy their tea at a cheaper price. Uh, and therefore, you can imagine that the British are really surprised when the American reaction is anything but that. The Sons of Liberty say, aha, we finally caught the British red-handed because they've been trying to convince us to buy taxed British tea for years, and we've refused because we're not going to establish the precedent of paying British taxes imposed on us without representation. And the British, seeing that failure, have decided to enhance the seduction. Now we're going to bring tax British tea to the American colonies at such an inexpensive price that the Americans will not be able to help themselves. They're going to buy that cheaper tea, and when they buy that cheaper tea, they're going to pay that tax, and when they pay that tax, they're going to establish the right of Parliament to, to levy those taxes uh, without their consent. Uh, and so the Sons of Liberty, uh, who sort of prepared the ground very well for this uh, ever since the repeal of the taxes following the Boston Massacre, uh, were able to convince a large number of Americans that this was in fact the case. It was in fact the case. And so in town and city all across America, uh, people gathered together and promised, vowed that they would buy no East India Company tea. And some of the East India Company ships heading toward America found out about this and they turned around and they went back to England. Some came into port like Philadelphia and learned what was going on and were allowed to leave. But that's not what happened when three East India Company tea ships dropped anchor in Boston Harbor uh, in early December of 1773. Quickly enough, their captains discovered that the Americans were outraged and they weren't going to buy the tea and the captains wanted to up anchor and go back to England, but the governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson, was a legalistic kind of a guy. There were rules and rules must be followed. 
And the rule in particular here said that when a cargo enters the port, the captain of the ship has two weeks to pay whatever taxes and fees are due. And if he doesn't pay those taxes and fees within those two weeks, uh, then the cargo and the ship is confiscated, sold at auction to raise the money necessary to pay the taxes and fees. So a clock had started to tick. And although logically it would have been much smarter, politically certainly it would have been much smarter, uh, to let those T-ships leave, uh, that was not what the law said, and Hutchinson was determined to enforce the law. So these three ships are sitting there, with 340 chests of tea worth 10,000 pounds in Boston Harbor and nobody's buying the cargo. Shortly after the middle of December, the clock will run out, ships and cargo confiscated, sold at auction. The colonies have sent their message, right? You're not gonna trick us, you're, you're not gonna, we're not gonna fall for this clever little plot that the Tea Act represents. But for Sam Adams and the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, not good enough. Not good enough. Because the reality here is that they don't want this crisis to diffuse itself. They don't want this crisis to come to an end. They, they, the next time the British will try something, the next time they might be more clever, the next time we might not be able uh, to convince our fellow colonists about what uh, is going on. Uh, and so uh, they orchestrated uh, a more bitter resistance. They orchestrated a more bitter resistance to what the British were doing. Uh, they held a large meeting on December 16th of 1773 uh, and, uh, in Boston denouncing the British plot. And that evening, uh, 50 uh, Americans badly disguised as Mohawk Indians slipped out onto the ships and perpetrated what becomes famous as the Boston Massacre. They boarded the ships, took control of them, and tossed those 340 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. They destroyed the cargo. They destroyed the cargo. And in destroying the cargo, uh, they laid the final straw on the back of the British camel. When the British heard about this, they were furious. The British people were furious. The British press was furious. The, the British parliament was pu furious. What was all of this about? Why had the Americans done this? To the English, this makes no sense. The Americans were delusional. They were paranoid. And this act of treachery, this act of terrorism was, was stepping over the line. Britain has finally had it. Britain has finally had it. If the American colonies are not going to obey the law, if the British colonies are not going to submit to royal authorities, if the British colonies are going to continue to do these kinds of things in America, uh, then the British colonies have to be punished. Remember, the, the, the art of parenting is well understood. Uh, in the 18th century. Children are to be seen, not heard. You, you uh, don't you know, spoil a child, spare the rod. Children should be beaten into obedience if necessary. Uh, and so the British decided that the time had come uh, to beat the people of Boston and Massachusetts into obedience. They're going to impose a series of draconian laws on the people of Boston. And those laws are going to force the people of Massachusetts to back down, to submit to the authority of the crown, to beg forgiveness. And if you can break Massachusetts, the troublemaker, uh, then, uh, then the other colonies will fall into line. And so a crisis now is at hand. Uh, the British are about to impose laws that the Americans are not going to be able uh, to, to tolerate. Uh, and the result is going to be the final sequence of events that are going to end on a little green in a town outside of Boston called Lexington where there will be a gunshot that will inaugurate a war. Uh, so that is the end of lecture four, part one. Uh, I'm gonna ask you uh, two questions uh, from this uh, lecture. Uh, question number one, what is the name of the British organization that is to enforce the Townsend Revenue Acts and the Navigation Acts? What is the name of uh, the British organization that is to enforce the Townsend Revenue Acts and uh, the Navigation Acts. And the, the second 
uh, question is, uh, what is the name of the British law that declared that Parliament was supreme over the American colonies in all cases whatsoever? What is the name of the British law that says Parliament is supreme over the American colonies in all cases whatsoever? Uh, so those are your two questions from this lecture. When we have uh, part two of lecture four, there'll be three questions, uh, and we will take ourselves to uh, the start of the Revolutionary War, and I look forward to seeing you then. Remember, you can ask me questions by email or if you wanna talk about the material, always happy to do that with you, and I look forward to seeing you next time.